Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Our, our next speaker is Greg Bishop. Um, many of you may know Greg personally. Um, he's not unknown to the UFO field. Um, like many of us here, he's been interested and looking for some truth in the field for, for years. But also, that's really key because Greg is just like most of us. He's honestly just a regular guy. And it's amazing what we can do when we will take the time to really thoroughly dig into something. And yes, um, we do get a lot more insight about things after they have already happened. But look at all of the incredible cases and incidents in the field that come and go and never get the kind of an in-depth look and investigation that Greg has given to Paul Benowitz and his story. And that's why Greg is here. This book, Project Beta, the story of Paul Benowitz, national security and the creation of a modern UFO myth. It's great research. It's a good read. Greg is just like us. Give him a big welcome. Greg Bishop. Thanks, Rob. Am I coming through? Yes, I am. Oh, a little bit of feedback. They told me to fold that down. I can't really see everybody. I was going to ask how many people have actually uh, heard of Paul Benowitz. Now I can kind of see. Uh, good. How many of you have read the book? Great. Okay, good. That makes me feel better because I can be a little bit broad in what I talk about. Uh, are we going to get our slide up here, please? First one. Do I have to hit a button? There we go. There we go. Oh, good. The date's right. All right. Uh, maybe I should preface all this by um, telling you how I got interested in this story. Uh, I actually was interested in UFOs when I was a child, and then when I got into high school, for some reason, that interest went away. <clears throat> but um, sometime in my mid-20s, it came back. And uh, because of that, I found out I was working in an office a half a block from Bill Moore. So I gave him a call. He told me to come down. And uh, this was in 1987 or 88, I think. And uh, when uh, how many of you have heard about the, uh, that big speech he gave in Vegas in 1989? I'm afraid this one isn't going to be as dramatic. Uh, <laughs> but beforehand, people had, there were rumors flying around. People thought he was a government agent or, or do, was doing something nefarious behind their backs. Uh, and as it turned out, he was, but not in the way that most people thought. And I think people still kind of misunderstood, misunderstand what's going on or what was going on with Bill. Before that speech, he told me, I'm going to, I'm going to do something that's going to blow everybody's socks off, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. Um, the speech was, uh, it was uh, pretty incredible. Uh, I've never seen that kind of reaction to a talk. I mean, if, if, they were, if, if people had vegetables, they would have been throwing them. They had to stop the talk about four or five times just because of all the yelling. People getting very angry about uh, the revelations. And the revelations that came out were partially based on what I'm going to talk about to you today. There's a, there's a graphic of the book, so you can just, uh, see it big. Okay, this is Paul Benowitz. It's the only picture I was able to find of him. Uh, I put out a call on the Internet, uh, offered a $100 bounty for a picture of Paul besides this one. <laughs> Nobody had one, so I got this one, um, a, an original print from Wendy Connors, who's in Albuquerque there, if you know who she is. Um, Paul was uh, owned a, um, a company called Thunder Scientific. They built uh, temperature and humidity instruments for the government, um, private industry, and I think he actually tried to get a contract to sell things to uh, the Soviets, but that was turned down in, uh, in the late 70s. That's his home. He, the business was pretty successful. He was a good inventor. He was an electrical physicist. 
never got a doctorate. I think he had a master's. People sometimes refer to him as Dr. Benowitz, but he never did actually himself. So the business did pretty well. The Four Hills neighborhood in Albuquerque is an exclusive area. There's a golf course there, country club. Uh, that's his company. That's the sign that's there right now, right outside of uh, Kirtland Air Force Base. Maybe I can... Uh, is that working? That's the Wyoming gate, Wyoming Avenue gate of Kirtland Air Force Base. So Paul lived, uh, he, wor he worked right next door to Kirtland Air Force Base, and that house is right next door to the Air Force Base as well, but literally on the border, both, both his house and his company. Um, actually, you can, right down there is a little warning sign saying that you're not supposed to come on the base without authorization. There's a bunch of guards standing here in Kevlar um, bulletproof vests, looking menacing who sent me off the base more than once. But I did manage to get in, and I'll talk about that, too. Kirtland Air Force Base is a huge, huge Air Force Base. It was uh, founded in the 1930s, I believe, and in 1947, right after World War II, it expanded very incredibly far. Uh, I probably have to walk out here a little bit. Let's see. Have you ever, if anybody's ever been to Albuquerque, um, right there, I think I can see that, or this one. Yeah, that's the Albuquerque International Airport. So if you fly in, sometimes you come in this way, you fly right over the base. I mean, you can see all this. Uh, Paul Benowitz's home, it can't see too well. Paul Benowitz's home, see all the green area? That's a golf course. Paul Benowitz's home is right there. This is all the base. It goes further south than this. It's huge. That is the view of Kirtland Air Force Base from the, from the Four Hills neighborhood, from near Paul's uh, house. Uh, the house is still there. His wife still lives there. His sons actually still run Thunder Scientific. Can't read that too well. It's a warning, another warning sign. You know, no no entry without uh, permission of base commander. There's uh, barbed wire on the top. You know, the usual stuff you see around a military installation. However, let me back up here. This area right here is called Monzano Mountain or Monzano Hills, and that thing going around it is a fence. It's a double electrified fence. Because in 1947, in 1947, the government thought this would be a good area to store nuclear weapons. So they started digging and digging and digging. Uh, people said that they flew over the base and the, the uh, mountain resembled, resembled an anthill because there's a big pile of you know, mining tailings next to it, piles of rubble and things like that. They dug very far into this mountain. The guy that was in charge of it, actually, which gives you an indication of how important it was, was Leslie Groves, General Leslie Groves, who was in charge of the Manhattan Project. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the, they were digging this thing. Everybody knew it was there, but the, the workers that were actually working on it, they were compartmentalized. They learned how to compartmentalize very well uh, from the Manhattan Project. So workers would go in. They wouldn't know what you know, his, their buddies were doing. They, they'd be assigned different places every day. They'd go in with buses with blacked out windows. All this stuff you've heard about, this, this has been going on for a while. So that nobody would actually have an idea of where everything was, how big it was, all that. They might have an idea of one spot, but that's it. There's another view of it. Uh, th this is uh, the Four Hills neighborhood I was just talking about. There's, this, it, it's, uh, there's an exclusive area. Uh, actually where Paul Benowitz's house is, the Benowitz family home, is uh, back up behind this wall. And uh, here it says, uh, no, you know, you're not supposed to go in there unless you have some sort of business, just kind of uh, community thing. I guess he might have paid a little extra for that privacy. I did drive up there and look at the house, but I didn't hang around there. Um, because actually, I'll tell you, uh, I went and talked to Paul Benowitz's son, uh, Brad, I believe, and uh, I went unannounced to Thunder Scientific, walked in the door. He was very friendly until we went in the back office and I told him what I wanted to do. 
I said, I'm writing a book about your father and what happened to him in the, in the uh, late 70s and in the 80s. And before I could finish that sentence, he said, absolutely not. We don't have anything to do with it. And then he kind of waited for me to leave. Oh, and he also said, and my father died two weeks ago. So it was a very bad timing on my part. Uh, this is one part of the Manzano Hills. Uh, I was talking about that fence. You can sort of see it coming over here. They've actually found a few people actually electrocuted and dead in between those two fences. They had no idea how they got to those fences, but they couldn't get, you know, both of them are electrified. If you get over one, you still have to get over the other one. Uh, this is also uh, near Manzano Mountain. It's called the Starfire Optical Range. It looks like an observatory, and it isn't really. Uh, it does look into space, but it does other things too, which we will talk about. What Paul was doing was looking at this area and started seeing some strange things flying around, these lights. Um, he started uh, picking up radio signals. He was an electrical physicist. He knew how to figure things out. He actually started picking up these signals that were unlike anything he'd ever heard, coming in on a um, military channel or something that was supposed to be a military channel. Um, I added this picture because people seemed to like it. Uh, and it wasn't in the book uh, for reasons of space, I think. Um, Bill Moore was actually taken on Kirtland Air Force Base to this secret area that's behind the mountain. Uh, if you'd notice where Paul's house was, that mountain is uh, probably a couple thousand feet high. You can't see anything behind it. So a lot of the secret stuff is behind the mountain where nobody, no civilian can actually see it from the ground. Uh, Bill was taken on a drive through uh, the Kirtland Air Force Base more than once, Bill Moore. And uh, he was uh, asked to take a picture of this area here. And if you look, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but all back in here, this big white area, that's a whole cluster of buildings and warehouses and everything. And he said when he took the picture, he could see it. But when he developed it, that's what it came out looking like. And uh, I've talked to other people that said there is a way to do that, where you can see something, but you can't photograph it. It just whites out in, in pictures. I don't know how they do that, but it's a um, one indication of what's going on here and how secret it is. A lot of different um, organizations, agencies, NSA, DIA, CIA, all the, all the alphabet soup of agencies you can think of uh, have projects going on at Kirtland, and they did back then, obviously. I can't talk about what happened to Paul Benowitz without starting out with an abduction case of a woman named Myrna Hansen. In, uh, I believe it was April of 1980, she was driving home with her son at night in northwestern uh, New Mexico to a place called Eagle's Nest. That's where they, were, uh, that's where they lived. Um, they, were, they had gone to a bingo game or something, or family function. They were coming back late at night, um, and they were startled to see a big... A, a large ovoid football field size, I think she said, object floating over a pasture. And a smaller one, she said, was triangular. And as they stopped the car and watched, um, she said she saw a, a cow lifting up and going up inside one of the ships. Then the triangular one came closer. The car was enveloped in light, and uh, they had the missing time. Um, this was before any of this stuff was really standard in the field. So... Uh, very, one of the earlier earlier cases that uh, that uh, went a little bit further than just the person having the experience. And the reason it went further is because the next day she called the New Mexico State Police in Cimarron, which is the closest area to uh, Eagle's Nest that she could call. And uh, the guy there didn't know what what to do what to tell her. She said that she'd seen these things and she might have seen some small people. I think that's what the quote was from her. The guy didn't know what to do, but he did know there was one police officer who had been emerging as kind of a specialist in, in weird stuff like this. Uh, this. This was an officer whose name is Gabe Valdez, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of him. He's still alive, and he was very helpful and really nice guy. Um, he was working the, uh, the Dulce area, which, of course, a lot of you know about, where there are a lot of cattle mutilations, but we'll get into that later. Myrna Hansen was um, referred to Gabe. Gabe knew Paul Benowitz because they had met at a cattle mutilation conference about a year before. And Paul said, why don't you drive her over here and I'll talk to her. So they, 
they got a car, drove Myrna Hansen and her son, I think he was eight years old, all the way down to Albuquerque and uh, left them with Paul. Paul talked to her for a couple days and realized he needed some help. And he was a member of APRO, which is, uh, was the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Jim and uh, Coral Lorenzen ran that for many, many years until their death in the 90s. Um, the Lorenzens knew at least one good person that did uh, uh, regressions at that time. This was still very new. I mean, I don't even know if Bud Hopkins was doing regressions at that point, 1980. So literally three or four days after the abduction, I thought it was later, but it was very quick, um, he got in Paul got in touch with the Lorenzens, and they sent uh, this man to talk to Paul and Myrna Hansen, Leo Sprinkle, who I'm sure a lot of you know as well. Um, Leo was flown out to Albuquerque, came to the door, uh, regressed Myrna, and a story came out, a little bit more detail than I've told you about the cow. They saw a cow being, uh, a calf actually, uh, she said, being um, dissected or something horrible was done to it, and then she was examined, her son was examined, they were put back in the car. Um, I will jump ahead a couple of days, oh no, the next month, so this was one day. Um, Dr. Sprinkle did the regression, went back to uh, Wyoming. Then about a month later, Paul had him come back. Uh, I talked to uh, Dr. Sprinkle, and he said, when I came back, I didn't know what was going on. I came to the door. I went up to the door, and when Paul answered it, he had a rifle in one hand and a pistol on his hip and said, get in, they're, they're watching us. And Leo Sprinkle said, who? Who's he? he said, the aliens. Come on, get in. Um, I, I made a point in the book, I don't know what was going on in that month between the first visit by, uh, by uh, Dr. Sprinkle and the second one, but the second regression with uh, Sprinkle was, um, was so confused and, and, and frightening, and he had to bring her out of the trance a couple of times. She described things like this, these, these vats people have heard about, uh, and an underground facility. Um, she actually, she described the underground facility the first time, and the second time there's a little bit more detail. She said she saw human body parts floating in them. And uh, this is the only illustration I could find of such a thing uh, from uh, one of Chris, uh, from Kristen Tilton's book. Actually called the Benowitz Papers. It was the only book about Paul Benowitz until, until I uh, decided to write, write one. Yes, this is a little bit small. This is uh, one of the letters that uh, Paul sent to APRO after... Uh, after uh, Leo Sprinkle had been there the second time. He'd also picked up, an, uh, Sprinkle decided actually after that second visit not to come back because he didn't want to get involved in, uh, with this case if uh, one of the people in it was running around with a gun saying the aliens were coming over the wall at any minute. Uh, he, he thought that, and rightly so I think, that the, her, her mind had been too contaminated by things Paul might have told her in the meantime to get any kind of decent recall out of her. So, um, Paul actually got in touch with James Harder, who was another researcher who had actually gotten his, uh, made his name in the Travis Walton case. So Paul started sending these letters uh, to APRO. I'll read you this little part, since if you're in the back, you can't read it. The situation here is, this is from uh, August 28th, 1980, a few months after the first regression with Myrna Hansen. The situation here is serious, but not out of hand. She's getting the best treatment uh, by the pathologist and doctor at no cost to her. For an apparent alien bacteria, he thought that the aliens had put some sort of some sort of pathogen in her, and she was sick. Uh, we're trying to culture it. No luck as yet. It's evade of all of our known antibiotics and penicillin. She's also being badly beaten on by the alien with their beams. He he thought that uh, extraterrestrials, aliens, were beaming something at her and controlling her thoughts and her mind. But um, at that point, who knows what was going on? Because he was in such a horrible state as well. And this is this was right near the beginning of this saga. 24 hours a day she's being beaten on. These beams have been measured and are now getting a, we're getting a handle as to what they are. And there's, there's some uh, instructions there about how to regress people. Actually, I don't know if I had it, have it on this page, but um, they, they started doing very weird things like regressing Myrna Hansen in different areas trying to block these beams. They did it in hospitals and hotels um, and finally settled on Paul's Lincoln Continental in the garage with aluminum foil over the windows because he said that's, that was the only way to block the, whatever beams were controlling her. 
He may have been right. I don't know. I wasn't there. And James Harder said he didn't remember anything about it, which was kind of strange, which either means he doesn't remember or he didn't want to talk to me about it. He was nice about it, but he said he didn't remember. Uh, so also at this time, coincidentally, right before Myrna Hansen, Paul had been seeing these lights flying around from his house. I remember I said his house was right about there. Um, in this area, about a mile from his house, right out on the Air Force Base in this large, large kind of, not really a meadow, but an area of chaparral and scrub brush, dirt, etc. He saw these, he would usually see two lights sitting on the ground, kind of blinking off and on. And they had a shape to them, like they were, you know, he said they looked vaguely ovoid, saucer shaped. And I did not know this when I wrote the book, so this is a new one to uh, all of you, and it was to me a few months ago. Uh, Another researcher, Chris Lambright, who I mentioned in the book, um, emailed me after I sent him the book and said, oh, if I knew you were serious, I would have talked to you more. Didn't help me out at the time, but now I can tell you. Um, he said that uh, Paul used to see people walking around these lights on the ground, kind of with flashlights looking around. Then they'd leave, and then the lights would lift up off the ground, kind of stay stationary. They didn't actually jump around and do all these things I described in the book. They just went straight up in the air, stayed stationary for a while, and then zipped around the backside of Manzano. So they'd just sit here, raise up in the air, and then go zoop this way. And he said they did the same thing every time. They would just lift up in the air, fly around the back where you couldn't see them anymore, and land somewhere. Um, he also described a blue glow underneath the craft when they lifted up, which is something we will talk about later in the talk. The funny thing is that not only was Paul seeing strange things flying around, so was the Air Force. Also in uh, 1980, in August, August 8th and 11th, the, uh, very late at night, uh, security guards were out on patrol around Manzano Mountain, remember where all these nuclear weapons components are stored. It was actually the largest storage area for nuclear weapons in the world at the time. I think it only was surpassed in the, in the 90s at some point. I think it's been decommissioned. It's been being used for something else now, I think. One of the scientists said it was being used to store flying saucers, one of the guys I talked to. Um, but these guards were out on patrol. They go around every night to make sure that everything's uh, ship shape around the base. There's no strangeness. And uh, one of them sees a, f a light coming, flying in. I'll kind of uh, just talk about one of them. They're both, both basically the same kind of sighting. A light come, came in, um, hovered around, came close to the ground, and left. In one of the cases, the light actually came down and hovered and landed behind a storage bunker that had nuclear material in it. In one of these documents, not in this one, they said HQCR44, which is Headquarters Collection Requirement 44, which actually at that time referred to nuclear material. There was alarm on it. That's why on here, if you can read it, it say alarmed. It was an alarmed structure. Um, as the guy, the, the guard approached it with his flashlight, uh, his radio went dead. He asked who was there, took out his um, sidearm or shotgun or something like that. The light lifted up off the ground and took off. And this happened on two nights, August 8th and 11th, 1980. It was investigated by the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, which is basically the police force for the Air Force. They're, they're like the cops. They do, you know, they do investigation. They're actually they're like the, uh, the detectives. They do investigation, gather information and evidence on people for any kind of wrongdoing within or outside having to do with the Air Force. That's kind of a, based on what I read and, and people I talked to, I kind of drew a little uh, map here of where the, the UFO came in, the light came in, kind of went over their heads, and then landed over here at the edge of this map where that structure is. This road out here, which is behind the mountain, has all kinds of different storage areas. The, that picture I showed you with the, where all the buildings are whited out is down in here. All of it behind this mountain, because Albuquerque's out over here. And there's a high, uh, Highway 40's up here, but there's hills in between. You can't really see anything. So it's pretty well protected from prying eyes, and that's what they wanted. The other weird thing that happened is August 13th, the Air Force had to deal with all their radar being cut out, being jammed. August 13th, 1980, maintenance officer reported radar approach control equipment and scanner radar inoperative due to high-frequency jamming 
from an unknown cause. Total blackout of entire radar approach system to include Albuquerque Airport was in effect between 1630 and 2215. What's that? Uh, 430 and uh, 1030, I think. So radar approach, con- uh, 1015. Uh, radar approach control backup systems were also inoperative. Um, somebody was jamming their radar for uh, five or so hours. They couldn't get anything to work. Bill actually, Bill Moore actually went down to the Albuquerque airport and looked at the, the log for the uh, control tower. And there was an entry in there, radar inoperative, working on it, don't know what to do. And then suddenly at uh, 10.15, boom, all the radar comes back on again and is working. They had to divert traffic from the airport, everything. Nobody was ever able to explain, at least as I can find out, where that jamming was coming from, although one of the reports said it came from inside the Coyote Canyon test area, that area I just showed you that was all whited out. So they may have been testing something, and they didn't tell anybody. They just want to see if it worked, or maybe it worked too well. I do not know. Actually, one of the talks, uh, one of my talks, my friend Walter Bosley, who's a former Air Force OSI as well, told me that um, he's got friends in Iraq. There are people that go up forward before the uh, before planes come in to bomb. And uh, he said that these people go up and, you know, they, they sit there with night vision and watch things to make sure everything, uh, you know, that nobody knows they're coming. He said that uh, before probably about five minutes or less before the stealth fighters come in, something silent goes flying over. Um, doesn't look like a plane, and then it goes back behind lines again. And uh, they may be jamming radar. I don't know what those things are, but you can be sure there's, being, there's things being used all over the world by the United States that we have no idea. I'm sure you all know that or all think it or feel it. But as you get to look, start to look into it, these things are borne out. I just put that picture again I, to show you that the, about right here, these lights would rise up. Flood. They wouldn't go up very high. They'd go up below the level of the mountain from where he was looking, go around here, and then boop, go behind there. And he was filming these things. He was filming them, and uh, I think he was using videotape as well. It was kind of early for home videotape. Oh, that's where the Starfire optical range is, I, I believe. Down there I put Lovelace Research Facility. Lovelace is a medical center in Albuquerque, and uh, they were involved with uh, something having to do with uh, uh, cancer patients, terminal cancer patients. And here on the Air Force facility where nobody could look, they would bring these people in and apparently with their consent try out these radical cancer um, treatments on them uh, just to see if it would work or not. If they didn't, they died, but the people thought they were going to die anyway, so they literally signed their lives away. Myrna Hansen was also taken here. Paul Benowitz actually requested that she be x-rayed because he thought that she had something implanted in her neck. And this is before anybody was talking about implants, so maybe he was ahead of the curve. He said that he saw things on the x-rays. Nobody I talked to that actually saw those x-rays said they saw anything out of the ordinary, which is not the first time that Paul would see things and other people wouldn't. Oh, what people, uh, what uh, some people in the Air Force and outside the Air Force told me is what they might have been testing were uh, unmanned aerial vehicles for surveillance. But I don't think something like this, which has a uh, propeller in the middle, a ducted fan, is going to go up that quick, fly that quickly around, and most importantly, have that kind of look with a glow. So they may have been unmanned aer- aerial vehicles, but they certainly weren't things like this which I gave a few pictures of, just so you know what, they're, what they look like when you see one. There's a very unusual one, and uh, th- that's at uh, Fort Huachaca in Arizona. Uh, this is just from an unmanned aerial UAV site, uh, website, very, very freely available. And that looks very weird, but it does fly. That's uh, still of one of Paul's 8 millimeter vid- uh, movies that he took of these lights. Um, it's zoomed in, so you can't really tell what's going on. However, you do see the blue glow he was talking about. Nobody else actually ever really talked about seeing these lights. And if they, you know, I'm going to go back to Albuquerque next week. Maybe we can find somebody that actually saw these things besides Paul, because they were there. He did film them, and they certainly weren't conventional aircraft. What Chris Lambright told me is that probably the Air Force was very interested in what he was seeing because he had, he had a handle on something very, very early on. 
uh, starting in 1979 with these lights and the signals as well that I will talk about. There's a strange picture he took of something. That's a, I think that's a PSA jet flying into Albuquerque International. And something that looks kind of saucer-shaped and shiny. And I believe I, I got this from Gabe Valdez, and he told me that Paul said he never saw this when he took the picture. But when it was developed, it came out looking like that. Uh, another thing they could have been testing were anti-gravity type craft. There's a lot of evidence, uh, especially if you read uh, Nick Cook's book, uh, Hunt for Zero Point. Very good book about uh, history of possible anti-gravity research. And um, in late 1980, uh, I'm sure you, a lot of you know about the Cash Landrum incident. Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum were driving in Texas, uh, uh, I think south Texas near Houston, and um, they came upon this thing floating over the road. It was shooting flames out the bottom. I asked, actually, um, Richard Doty, or I'll introduce later uh, in this talk, about this. And he said it was, a, um, it was an anti-gravity craft that used nuclear propulsion to uh, get up into the air. And when it's further, far up enough that they, could, you know, not, uh, they wouldn't have to fall too far, uh, they'd turn on the anti-gravity. Um, they said it was diamond-shaped and had these little lights around, uh, windows or portals or something very small around it. Um, and some helicopters came after a while and kind of escorted it away. It looked like it was in kind of some sort of trouble. Um, they did get radiation, all kinds of symptoms of radiation poisoning after that. What Doty said was that these, this was a test craft, and it had, it had, these were cameras. They had the pilot inside, or pilots had to be so shielded from the radiation coming from the uh, power plant that they, uh, they, they couldn't afford to have windows in it. So they had cameras looking out. So they had all these cameras. And some of their cam he said some of their cameras had gone out and they couldn't see, which is why they had to stop for a while. Um, I don't know whether to believe that. It sounds as reasonable as anything else. Paul heard about this case as well, and it, it uh, excited him as connections with what he was seeing. Um, I mentioned Gabe Valdez earlier. He was up in Dulce, New Mexico State Police, along with you know busting you know, drunks and uh, uh, breaking up fights and all that. He also got called out on uh, these details where people found cattle mutilated out in their fields. There's a lot of cattle ranching, sheep ranching, other animals too, but mostly cattle. Um, so he was well familiar with strange stuff going on. Uh, everybody's seen stuff like that. Actually, that's a picture from Gabe, a very early cattle mutilation site near Dulce. Uh, that's a picture Gabe gave me of his formal picture when he was in the uh, state police. Now he's in uh, Albuquerque working at a car dealer. The thing that Gabe told me that I thought was very interesting was that he would find things occasionally near these cattle mutilation sites. And uh, one of them was this, a gas mask. And another strange thing, around this cow, this dead cow, they found all this stuff that looked like radar chaff, the thing that's thrown out of the back of planes to confuse uh, uh, enemy uh, missiles. So the radar will bounce off this metallic flakes and aim for that instead of the plane. But this was all around a uh, mutilated cow. They were all over the ground, and he said there were these little paper, uh, paper envelopes that had some, like, there was some in there, but it hadn't been ejected properly. And, and the weirdest part was some of the chaff was stuffed in the cow's mouth, and that's how they found it. I don't know what message they were trying to send there, um, but it, uh, I said in the book, and it indicated to me that um, if there's aliens doing, or extraterrestrials, something not human um, doing these things to cattle, then uh, they're choosing a very strange way to try and make us think it's not them. As, as some cattle mutilations research, researchers have told me. They, they said, um, well, the aliens do that to make you think there's humans involved. And I, I kind of found that hard, it's kind of a stretch, but um, there are aspects to the mutilation phenomenon that are completely unexplainable, and therefore I leave it in the, you know, we'll wait and see box. There is a lot of evidence here that humans are involved directly. Uh, so, Paul Benowitz was seeing all these lights. He was picking up these signals. Being a good American, a loyal citizen, he was, in the, he was actually in the Coast Guard in World War II. He enlisted. He, he wasn't drafted. He decided to call the Air Force and say, you know what's flying over your base here? There are these lights. I'm getting these weird signals. I think it might be something you want to look into. So he called the base, 
and talked to this man, Ernest Edwards, who was head of security. He passed them off, passed Paul off to this man, Richard Doty, who was a special agent, which uh, is the title you get when you're in the OSI, Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Um, he called Paul up. Uh, decided he would take a visit out to his company to Thunder Scientific since it was right there outside the gate. And after talking to Paul, he thought, maybe there's something here we do actually want to talk to Paul about. That's a, re that's a picture from, I think, 2000. Actually, it's a family picture. There's his wife and his daughter are kind of cropped out. I thought it would be good for that. But that's the picture he let us use for the book. Um, this is a report on uh, that visit to Paul Benowitz's house. Uh, Richard Doty actually took a scientist with him, Jerry Miller. I call him Lou Miles in the book because he told me not to use his name, but since it's not in the book, I'll use it here. I'm uh, sure some of you heard of Jerry Miller. He's not very well known, but he was very intimately involved in this case, although he wouldn't really reveal it to me in a, an obvious way when I talk to him. He's very helpful, really nice guy. He's in his uh, late 70s now, still lives in Albuquerque. They were sent over to Paul's house on October 26th of 1980 to see what Paul had, look at his pictures, his films, see what he was recording, see his equipment set up. Uh, this is the report that Richard Doty wrote. This is the second page. His, it says, um, Dr. Benowitz produced several electronic recording tapes allegedly showing high periods of electrical magnetism emitted from the Manzano Coyote Canyon area. Coyote Canyon is that area behind the mountain where that uh, whited out facility is. Dr. Benowitz, he calls him doctor for some reason, also produced several photographs of flying objects taken over the general Albuquerque area. He has several pieces of electronic surveillance equipment pointed at Manzano and is attempting to record high-frequency electrical beam pulses. He claims these aerial objects produce these pulses. Uh, after analyzing the data, Mr. Miller related the evidence clearly shows some type of unidentified aerial objects caught on film. However, no conclusions could be made about whether these objects pose a threat to Manzano or Coyote Canyon. And, um, oh, this is something interesting here that nobody really ever talks about. Mr. Miller has contacted Foreign Technology Division personnel at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base who expressed an interest and are scheduled to inspect Dr. Benowitz's data. Um, I don't know if that was ever done. We have no release documents pertaining to that. He, he had worked at Wright-Patterson. He had actually worked with J. Allen Hynek for a little while. And I don't know if it was related to UFOs, but... Um, Jerry Miller was very interested in UFOs, at least he was at the time. And because of this personal interest, he seemed like the go-to guy when something weird like this was going on over the base. Um, DC-2, I think, check means a background check. And uh, responsive to HQCR-44, like I said, uh, nuclear material. Uh, on November 10th, based on the information that Jen, uh, Jerry Miller and Richard Doty provided, they had invited Paul Benowitz onto the base to speak to people who were involved with projects at the base because they wanted to find out if he was watching anything that had anything to do with their particular area of expertise. About 10 people came to the meeting, 10 or 12, and um, I talked to a guy in the NSA who said that he had not been there, but he had known people that had, and Paul Benowitz started talking, and by the time he was finished, there were only two or three people left. They all just left the meeting and took off. And uh, I think the reason they did this is because they, they realized that uh, what he was doing had nothing to do with their, what they had to deal with, so they weren't interested. However, a couple people did stay. Uh, one of them was a guy named Dr. Lehman. Uh, I haven't been able to figure out what he was in charge of. He's just another Air Force scientist. Um, Oh, also he said a couple of NSA people were very interested, which gave me a clue as to what was going on. Um, the NSA, as you know, uh, tracks uh, mess electronic uh, messages. Just listen. <laughs> if you have been looking at the news any time in the last few months, that you know exactly what the NSA does and what they shouldn't be doing. So at this meeting, these people uh, listened to Paul. Most of them took off, but the NSA stayed because the NSA were involved in these signals that Paul was picking up, and they wanted to find out how he was picking up, them up and if he was figuring them out, because they were coded signals that they had been developing for months or years, and 
some guy sitting off, off the base here suddenly creates his own setup, puts up some antennas, and starts figuring out what this stuff is. Made them very nervous. Um, and I can't do anything with this story or go any further until I talk about Bill. Bill being Bill Moore back in. Um, uh, that, I don't know where he got that T-shirt, but that's the picture he gave to me. <laughs> he said, this is a picture from about three years ago, and he's, he was doing research for a book on the Mormon church, uh, which is out now. I think it's called The Spalding Enigma, who really wrote the Book of Mormon. So he's kind of out of the UFO field. I asked him why. It's like, why did you drop out? I mean, you were, you were on the trail of something very important here. And he said, because I went as far as anybody I'd known probably further, and I couldn't find anything out. I couldn't get any further than anybody else. I don't know what was going on, and I still don't. I, he, has, he has a clue, but the ultimate answer, you know, are, is there some sort of other uh, consciousness, civilization, uh, something non-human here, and do we have contact with it? He's still not sure. Oh, let me back up, because I'm not going to talk about that yet. Um, Bill was approached because he had just written a book, The Roswell Incident. The first book on the Roswell crash ever written came out in 1979, I believe. He was on a, he was on a speaking tour, or actually on a radio tour, going to radio stations. And uh, he stopped at the Albuquerque station. And after he got out of, the, out of his interview, the phone rang, and the woman said, there's a call for you. And on the other end of the line was somebody saying, I think you're the only person we think knows what he's talking about. And he had gotten the same phone call about a month before at another radio station. He didn't have time to answer it. But this time he said, okay, I'm in Albuquerque for a couple of days. What do you want to do? Well, we'll meet you at this restaurant at this time. Show up. So he actually showed up at the restaurant about 15 minutes early to check things out. And as he was sitting there looking at the restaurant, waiting, some, a tap came on his window, and he looked, and there's this, oh, the guy said, I'll be wearing a red tie. And he looks out the window, and there's a red tie hanging outside the window. Um, they go into the restaurant, and so the guy was watching him, watching for, you know, Bill, you know, the guy was watching Bill, who was watching for him. Always a step ahead. They go into the restaurant, and uh, they say we, and Richard Doty was there. The man I was talking about was a man I refer to in the book as Falcon. Uh, a lot of you have heard of him. That was a nickname that uh, Bill Moore and his partner, Jamie Chandere, gave to him, as well as a bunch of other people that they were dealing with in the government that they called the aviary. People think the aviary was something that was an official government deal. No, it wasn't. It was just names that uh, Bill and, and Jamie Chandray gave to their contacts. Uh, so Falcon goes in the restaurant with him. Richard Doty's there. And they offered him a deal. And the deal was, what we want you to do, they said, was to keep tabs on the UFO community, what they're thinking, what they're saying, what the general, you know, what the rumors making the rounds, and report back to us on that. And in return, you will get information that nobody else has ever gotten. Uh, he thought about it and said, well, I guess that sounds okay. He's still a little unsure. Um, however, at the next meeting, oh, that's not, uh, I'm sorry. They had, uh, they had uh, somebody had sent out a letter before, the, before all of this happened from a guy um, who claimed to know about a man named Craig Weitzel. He had a uh, UFO sighting at Kirtland Air Force Base, had a visit from a so-called man in black. He didn't say man in black, but he says, you know, the individual was thin, had, some, had glasses, uh, sunglasses, uh, dark complexion, and his name was Mr. Huck, which is very funny because uh, I, I learned later that one of the secretaries at the AFOSI was named Mrs. Huck. Uh, there was there are certain amounts of information. This was sent to the APRO. There are th things in the letter like uh, the, the U.S. Air Force has crashed UFOs stored in Manzano storage area. It's heavily guarded by um, Air Force security. I spoke with two employees of Sandia Labs who also store classified objects in Manzano, and they told me that Sandia has examined several UFOs over the last 20 years. One that crashed in Roswell, New Mexico in the late 50s. Whoever was creating this didn't read their book very well was examined by Sandy, well, maybe it was a late 50s, Sandia scientist. The, the craft is still being stored in Manzano. 
What this letter was was an attempt to go out into the UFO community and grab somebody who might be interested and see if they could be used. Um, it didn't work with Bill because he actually called up Craig Weitz and he said, I don't know who wrote that letter. I didn't have anything to do with it. And plus, a lot of the things are wrong. Um, the, the craft did not land, like it says in the letter. It just flew over. I didn't take any pictures of it. And it was just kind of a sighting. It was very high up. So Bill ignored it. However, because probably the reason, you know, for the very reason that he ignored it and checked it out is why the Air Force contacted him again because they wanted somebody who was careful. Um, Hmm. I'll show you this. The second meeting with Falcon, where Richard Doty was, they actually handed him this, this document, which has come to be called the Silver Sky Memo. What it was was a report on a, a UFO sighting witnessed by a lot of people, civilians in the southern New, uh, southern New Mexico area in the mid-60s. They handed him this document and said, why don't you check this out? So he did. He actually went to, the, to these towns, um, Socorro, Roswell, strangely enough, different places. None of the people that are listed on this, on this document either existed or were there. They, they had all moved out long before. So at the next meeting, he went back and said, this, this is complete junk. This, there's no truth to this whatsoever. What are you trying to do? And they, uh, he said that uh, Falcon looked at him and kind of smiled and said, good, you passed the test. What the test was was to find out if there was somebody that was careful enough to listen to what they were saying but not go out and blab it right away, to check things out carefully. And uh, since Bill appeared to want to do that, he was their man. He said, yes, I will uh, do what you want. Just uh, you know, keep up your end of the deal. Uh, in 1989, on July 1st, he announced that he had done all this in this speech I talked about, which got a lot of people very upset. This is the uh, actual speech, a paper that he had sitting in front of him while he did the talk. I thought it was kind of funny. He said, ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies, and he changed it to adversaries. Uh, great way to open a talk. Uh, another interesting thing I found, and he said he doesn't know why he put this in here. What with all this disclosure stuff coming out now? Um, he said, I believe there are, we are very near to getting these answers we all claim to want. If the nature of those answers turns out to be such that that they will change our world, then I need not point out that individual lives will be changed as well. It's important to know where we all stand. Very weird to hear that come from somebody who completely gave up on things, but at that point, when he wrote the speech, he crossed it out. He didn't actually say that during the talk, but he thought things were just around the corner here. There was some kind of disclosure going to come out. So what did Moore get in return for uh, reporting on uh, various UFO researchers? Now, I think... Let me stop here and say I think he was re what they wanted was reports on what these UFO researchers knew because they wanted to find out if they knew anything about any of their projects. Something might be leaking out. What about this anti-gravity thing? What if a re UFO researcher says there's these things flying out around in Nevada and uh, we wonder what they are and we think they're from the you know we think they're from another planet. However, somebody from Russia or China or something like that will say, well, that's very interesting. They don't think it's aliens. They think it's something that we're developing. So the UFO subject, as you know, attracts not only people like us and um, the news, people like that, but also foreign intelligence who want to try and find out, under the guise of being innocent UFO researchers, what the, you know, what's going on around these military bases. And they'll show up with cameras with big, long lenses on them and say, you know, well, you know i just looking at the plane. I think it's neat. But they're taking pictures and sending them back. That's what they were concerned about. I don't think they were so much concerned about what the UFO subject is or where it might come from, at least the people that Moore dealt with. Um, I'm trying to find out who Falcon was, and I think the answer lies in somebody who was very involved in counterintelligence, not in somebody who is, is uh, talking about UFOs and extraterrestrials. Uh, it may, may not be the answer people expect or want, but I think that's what it is. And um, sometime in the next few months or year or so, at some point, I guess I will, uh, if I can find out who, make a good guess as to who Falcon is, his identity. He's dead now. Um, I will say something about it. So what did Moore get back? What did he get in exchange for this deal? First thing was the Silver Sky Memo, which was, of course, complete junk. But he checked it out. 
The next thing, which everybody knows about, everybody sitting in this room, if you don't get out, is the uh, MJ-12 documents that were mailed to Jamie Chandere in the late 1980s, or I think it was 86. Somebody correct me? They showed up on his doorstep on a roll of film. Uh, maybe it was a little earlier. It showed up on a roll of 35 millimeter film. They developed it, and this came out. Um, a lot of people uh, immediately thought it was fake. Um, Moore did not know, and he never said it was real. At least I don't think he did. He said he thought it might be. He actually has a book called The MJ-12 Documents where he examines a lot of these documents that he got from the government and figures, tries to figure out if they're authentic or not. And the closest he's get, he gets to any of these is appears to be genuine. I think on this, his first assessment was that it appeared to be genuine, but there was not enough information to determine for sure. Of course, this document, the Eisenhower briefing document, talked about the formation of a group that would uh, control uh, the flow of UFO information to the public and within the government and was headed by a 12-member group. And they were listed there, and a lot of you probably already know about that. Another strange thing he got, which he gave to me, he said he got in 1984, and was sitting in, an old, you know, in a file in his room, was a map of Area 51. And in 1984, nobody knew about this. Nobody said anything. And no, you know, uh, it only started becoming a uh, big deal in the UFO community in the early 90s. When, uh, what was his name? Uh, what was the name of the radio show? It... Yeah, well, Bob Lazar came out a little bit later. There was a show being aired out of Alaska, and somebody, uh, Bob Lazar, got in touch with them, and it's beginning in 89 or 90 that started. But this was way back in 1984. Uh, Falcon or somebody handed this to Bill Moore and had written on this map had drawn something that said Groom Lake facility remember 1984 radiation area which became famous later because the uh, people at the base actually sued the government for being exposed to radiation and toxic waste and um, this over here which is very interesting S4 area saucer mesa I asked Bill what he did with this. He said there was nothing I could do with it. I can't get on the base. There was nothing I could do about it. So he just sat on it. He didn't do anything with it. And then I guess um, when Bob Lazar came out, um, somebody else was trying to get more information out. So I, I fully believe that Bob Lazar, if, if he wasn't supposed to say what he was, we wouldn't have heard from him. He kept saying he was being threatened and all that, and I'm sure he was. But if you want to shut somebody up, you can shut them up. Uh... What they wanted to do with Paul was after they found out that his attention was on Kirtland Air Force Base and these lights and these signals, was to get his, his uh, attention focused away from Kirtland and at something else. They knew he was interested in the Dulce area. Um, Gabe was from there. And Myrna Hansen actually said that the base that she saw in her abduction in northeastern New Mexico was in near the Dulce area in New, northwestern New Mexico. Um, so Richard Doty and a few other people who took uh, control of Paul's perceptions decided to direct his attention elsewhere. They, they uh, figured since he was already interested in the area, why not point him more in this area? And one of the ways they did this was that they had a computer program delivered to his house. Actually, a whole computer, because in 1980, 81, there were no personal computers. Paul built his own. He wrote the software, everything. And with that software, he, was start, he started to figure out some of these messages. So in 1980 or so, they brought him a computer. And Bill told me that the computer was brought to him by J. Allen Hynek. No one else has been able to confirm that. But I put it in the book because it's, you know, if that's true, it's kind of incredible. Um, Dr. Hynek was still on the, on the payroll with the Air Force and occasionally talked to them and did things for them. He was still a consultant. It's not to defame anything he's done and the great work he did, but he was possibly involved in this case. The Center for UFO Studies, which um, is still in existence, of course, I asked them for any records on such a thing, and they couldn't find anything or didn't look. I don't know which. 
uh, I didn't tell them why I was looking. I just said, do you have any records uh, that Dr. Hynek had on Paul Benowitz? And they said, I think so. Dr. Mark Rodiger, who runs it, said, I think so. But I, I, after repeated calls and emails, he didn't look, he didn't bother to get back to me. So I guess either they didn't have it or they weren't interested. Um, however, this new computer program that was handed to Paul started, uh, he would pick up these, these signals and translate them. And his old, his old system worked okay. But the NSA were very scared because he was starting to figure out what, the, what messages were being sent back and forth. So they decided, why don't we give him a computer with messages encoded in it already? So this is what they did. And when he started to uh, decode some of these messages, this is the kind of stuff that came out. Uh, we women do not marry, realize we are not unity. We are separate victory, grow. We have no obligation to keep secret. Now, now oxygen, you jump, have many. This stuff like this. Pages and pages and pages of it. And Paul would go over it and put these little marks on here to, to indicate things he thought were interesting. But what he didn't know is it was being stage managed from the get-go. He didn't, you know, he didn't know that this. He thought the Air Force was his friend, um, and he, 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 they, he, they cultivated that uh, interest with him. A lot of people asked, why didn't they just tell him to cut it out? He was a good guy. He, he would have just stopped. He thought he was, you know, he considered himself loyal American, and he, he would have stopped if they asked. I asked um, different people this, uh, most notably Doty, and. Uh, he said, well, if we have control of, you know, if, if we just um, tell him to forget it, we don't learn anything. What we wanted to learn was how he was figuring this out, where he was getting his information, and who he was talking to. Because this stuff going on at the base, they did not want getting out. It's right in the middle, still in the middle of the Cold War, actually ramped up Cold War with uh, Reagan being in office. So... What they did was they, they just, within these messages, which you could not see there, but within these messages they indicated to Paul, he thought it was the aliens, actually it was the NSA, who set up shop right across his house, uh, street from his house. They actually had a bunch of antennas pointing and sending signals straight into his house and watching him. He knew they were there. He didn't know who they were, but he, in some of his letters he said, there's somebody across the street watching me. I can see them and I can see them come out of the house once in a while. That house is not owned by anybody right now. It's, it's supposedly empty, but these people are in here all day and all night. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why he didn't just walk up to the door and ask them who they were. Maybe he did. What these message did was, uh, messages did was to direct his attention away from Kirtland. Remember, they were trying to stage manage all his perceptions while trying to find out what he was doing and how he was doing it and who was listening to him, either on purpose or, you know, by accident, inadvertently. So they pointed his attention up to the Archuleta Mesa near Dulce, New Mexico. That's a picture of the mesa with trees in front of it. Um, after a couple years of this, he actually started to, uh, well, actually this is 1981. He had different drafts. This was the first draft that he sent out to UFO researchers and investigators. Um, and he called his, his, uh, his, his, uh, research study, Project Beta, hence the name of the book. Um, and he summarized what he'd been doing for the last year or so and uh, what he'd found out and what he thought the threat was and what was going to happen. And, and actually later in the, the uh, piece and later in his research, he actually said he figured out how to shoot down UFOs. And he'd actually uh, worked on a device in the lab with a with a uh, with a colleague of his, this um, I think it was a Chinese guy, uh, some sort of beam weapon he thought would disrupt UFO propulsion drives. This is some of the stuff that uh, came out of the uh, of the program that was given to him. Um, this is his translation. Uh, up here, he says, uh, "These were found the first time by helicopter." What the Air Force did was they put him in a helicopter with Richard Doty the first time and flew him up to Archuleta Mesa, where unbeknownst to him, they had left props. They left jeeps, old uh, storage sheds and all that. And flew him high enough that he couldn't quite see what it was, but knew that there was something there. And it was almost impossible to get to this area by, by ground. Um, so they just airlifted all this stuff and then flew Paul up there and showed it to him. 
Um, people have told me, well, jo Doty just told you that. How do you know it's true? And it's like, well, Gabe Valdez told me. <laughs> he mentions it here in this letter to another researcher. So they did fly him up there. Um, hand rendered from analog recording of Hex ASCII prior to computer. Oh, so he figured this out on his own by looking at the at the data. But it was the data that was stage managed for him. So you know, what are you going to? What's he going to do? Um, this stuff is the stuff that came out of his, his uh, in, in the signals that were being sent to him by the NSA. This is his translation. I'll just talk to you about a couple of them. Den under Archuleta Peak. Um, the base is referred to as the den by the alien life forms. Number two, west of peak, snow gone. Snow is melted. Three, go west one kilometer. The M Implication is that the main entrance to the den is one kilometer west of the of the peak. That is near. That is near near correct. The insignia on the ground marks the prime entrance areas. He thought he saw these big insignias on the on Archuleta Peak. He took pictures of them, showed them to people. Nobody else seemed to see what he was seeing in the pictures. Um, after he figured all this stuff out, he started writing to the government. He wrote to his senator Pete Domenici, saying what he'd found out. He wrote to even President Reagan um, and didn't get much of a response, except um, I've seen some internal letters where people are trying to figure out what the hell's going on and why this person is sending this stuff and seems to know what he does, because there were some actual real things in his, uh, his uh, research that had to do with government projects, not really with aliens. So the AFOSI and NSA had to try to explain why this guy knew what they were, what they were doing. This was very interesting. This came in a few months ago. Um, and uh, you can probably read it, but I will read it out. Uh, Howard Burgess, who was actually one of the scientists working at Kirtland, began to tell me things that were certainly out of character for him. Apparently by 1985 or so, someone not identified to me working at Kirtland began telling him and a small group of other lab employees that the Air Force was flying joint U.S. alien missions out of Kirtland using ET craft, which the aliens supposedly were teaching us to fly. Howard and the others were told the ET craft gave off a certain electromagnetic signature. I have the frequency in one of my notebooks, which could be detected with simple electronic gear. Howard actually set up a monitoring unit in his garage. Why Howard and the others would believe this dubious story is unclear. How, whoever was telling them all of this was obviously very persuasive and presumably held a position at Kirtland which carried certain authority, at least in the minds of Howard Burgess and company. So they're apparently saying the same thing to these scientists they were saying to Paul which either means there were joint human-alien craft being flown there, or they really didn't want anybody to know what the hell they were working on there, or both. The source for this story would periodically call Howard or one of the other guys and say that on such and such a date, a certain time the signal would be detectable while the ET craft was operating south of Kirtland Air Force Base near Four Hills, Paul's neighborhood. According to Howard and the others, sure enough, they picked up an unknown signal at that exact frequency on more than one occasion over a several-month several period. Once, according to my other Sandia source, he and Howard stepped outside after detecting the signal and excited an extremely bright light above or just behind Four Hills. So I don't know why, but apparently the Air Force was disinforming its own scientists. I've got about 20 minutes left here, so I will kind of hurry. The Aquarius document was another thing handed to Bill Moore but they told him to give this document to Paul Benowitz because what it had on it was indications about uh, pieces of film he had sent to them. Um, one of them says negative number one, depicting, I think they mean depicting, C5A aircraft on approach, streaking unidentified aerial object at lower right portion of film, film to be found to be unaltered, which is funny because it kind of looks like that. But that's not a C5, that's a passenger plane. Uh, the other weird thing about this is there's a little thing down here. It was handed to Bill in 1981. There's a little phrase there which says, the official U.S. government policy and results of Project Aquarius are still classified top secret with no dissemination outside intel official intelligence channels and with restricted access to MJ-12. Somebody was putting out that little phrase in 1981. And it wasn't until 1988 when it was the, the Eisenhower briefing document was announced that that became kind of a common knowledge and a, and a cause celeb among ufologists. So what was going on here in, in 1981 with MJ-12? 
I asked a uh, few people, including Bill Moore, if they've ever found anything to indicate that there was a MJ-12. Yes, of course. The Truman uh, Forrestal memo where uh, Secretary of State Forrestal said he was going to go to an MJ-12 meeting, but it had been rescheduled. But the thing is, nobody's been, ever been able to find out through documents that MJ-12 had anything to do with UFOs, at least not conclusively. So there was an MJ-12. Whether it had something to do with UFOs or not, it's, I think, still an open question. Um, the other thing here down at the bottom, continue to receive assistance from individuals mentioned in your message. Miller Fugate, Jerry, Jerry Miller. The other guy was um, Robert Fugate. Oh, I found this recently. I got this from, uh, well, last year. I got this from uh, Bob and Ryan Wood, who lent this to me. This is part of those can't wheel documents that were given to them in the last uh, few years. Uh, this is the, uh, I went through this with a fine tooth comb, the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, personnel list from 1981. Here in Directorate for Scientific and Technical Intelligence, headed by Jack Verona, who some of you have, might have heard of, down there is Mr. J.R. Miller. Head of Weapons and Systems Division, Ballistic Missile Systems, Aerodynamic Systems, Naval Systems. So he was an important guy. And when I asked him about Benowitz and what was going on, he said, oh, there was a lot of stuff going on there. I'm not sure. Funny thing is, he did answer my questions in an indirect way a day or two or a week after I asked them. This is how people in intelligence do this if they want to help you. They will not answer your question directly, but they will bring up something later. Um, a very weird thing that happened later on in the 80s, while Benowitz was still convinced there was something going on at uh, Archuleta Mesa, was something that crashed there. And there was a crash. And he happened to be flying over in his plane. He was a private pilot. And he took pictures. The problem is the pic any good pictures he took were either taken or he, he never got good pictures because this is the kind of stuff that came out. Um, he said he saw things like a hot reactor. He said it was an atomic-powered uh, ship. Uh, given to the United States government by the alien. Um, and he drew these, drew these little keys to show where things were, but nobody, including me and anybody else I've showed this to, can figure out what he's talking about. Rocket engine, camouflage ship under ledge, saucer apparently on guard. I can't see that stuff in these areas he circled. And he, either there, he wasn't close enough or he was seeing things other people couldn't or both. Um, that's a letter he wrote to Bill about some of his reconnaissance up there. This is his first drawing of what he saw crashed up there. He said he saw when he flew over the Mesa. He later revised it to that, and then later revised it for some reason to that. Now, my guess as to what he saw there was a crashed stealth fighter, because it, you know, reasonably, if something crashed that looked like that, and this was in 1985, um, it wasn't even revealed for another five years or more to the public. Um, that could be what it looked like crashed on a mountain. However, um, Richard Doty, for some reason, told me that it was an unmanned aerial vehicle like these, one of these. Looks pretty close to that one, at least his first drawing, with little bumps on it and everything. And they certainly did not want anybody knowing about this or this information getting out in 1985. One other strange thing is that the NSA had a guy working at Lockheed, and he sent letters to Paul Benowitz, and a lot of these things about um, underground bases and deals with the aliens were first mentioned in letters to Paul Benowitz in the mid-'80s here. Um, there's something definitely gone in the, going on in the Dulce area. Um, and here's uh, one of the first mentions of this story. Several thousand years ago, a group of people revealed to us to be the E-bands, created two races of mankind. Um, the major... Uh, uh, the Homo sapiens and Swedes, which is very strange. It sounds like the 1950s contactees, Swedish, look, Nordic-looking thing, uh, people they called Swedes. He, although he spelled them S-W-E-A-D-S. I don't know what he was doing with Paul here, but he was trying to get him interested in this, in what he wanted him to be interested in, which was a uh, flying saucer or UFO crash in Archuleta Mesa, not a stealth fighter or an um, unmanned aerial vehicle. And uh, he wove this story, a uh, remote area near Roswell in 1947, two Swede aircraft crashed, obviously taking the cue from the Roswell incident book. One ship was totally destroyed. The other ship, though severely damaged, managed to maintain significant structural integrity and enable one crewman named EDE, I don't know why it is an EBE, extraterrestrial biological entity, 
Um, and to hook into his uh, growing suspicions here, he said that uh, Dwight Eisenhower initiated a project, project called Aquarius, designed to notify man of our creation by the, the, by the E-bands. I'm going to have to hurry up here. I'm sorry. Uh, another rumor that went around, Project Snowbird, initiated to enable us to learn how to fly the alien craft. Um, and finally, down here, the E-bands chose to construct their base near the town of Dulce in north, north central New Mexico. Um, and, and this crash, because of Paul's suspicions, he said, yes, the Swedes learned of our duplicity and destroyed the two ships as they were on final approach at the Dulce base. All designed to just steer him away from anything to do with government projects and onto UFOs. Maybe they were UFOs, I do not know, but it seems like their interest is very much in keeping people's interest and attention away from government projects and on the UFO subject and other planets instead of what's going on here. Just to prove that those were not just letters sent to him, he actually wrote back to the guy referring to things that he talked about in the letter. The guy's name was Ron, and then uh, he allowed, uh, this guy Ron from from uh, Lockheed wrote back to Paul. They exchanged letters for a while. So why, what were they trying to hide? What, why were they concer so concerned about Paul Benowitz and what he was looking at? Well, one thing obviously were these things flying, flying in front of, right in front of his house, literally almost, uh, in this area. Uh, I thought at first it had something to do with this. It's something called the trestle. It's this huge, huge wooden structure they used to roll um, B-52s and things out on them and then hit them with pulsed electromagnetic radiation like happens during a nuclear explosion to see if their electronics would get fried. But it didn't work too well, so it just now it just sits there. It's, this, it's a huge, huge thing. I mean, if you can fit a B-52 on it, it's pretty big. And it's made all out of wood because if they have any metal in it, it'll mess up their tests and some of the bolts might fly out and hit people. The other uh, thing that was going on at Kirtland is this, which I mentioned before, the Starfire Optical Range. The Starfire Optical Range is not an observatory for looking at planets and uh, looking at uh, stars and things like that. It's there to look at things that are very close to Earth up in space. Uh, the Aquarius document mentioned this guy, Fugate. Robert Q. Fugate uh, is a, I think he's still there and still runs the Starfire Range, is an optical physicist, and he invented a system whereby you could look at something in space, and you know when you look through a telescope, things kind of shimmer because of the atmosphere? They invented this system where they had a mirror. What the mirror would do would deform itself to correct for those shimmers. And it was basically like um, focusing, it was like taking a pool of water which has shimmers in it and flattening it artificially. And uh, the way they did this was focusing on something in the sky, feeding the information about what was shimmering into a computer, and then having a mirror with a bunch of little plungers on the bottom of it. You know, kind of big flat mirror and little plungers going up and down, all controlled by a computer. And this mirror would constantly be deforming itself. It's just a real thin sheet of metal to correct for that shimmer. And what they were doing with this was looking at satellites. The satellites were flying over Kirtland Air Force Base and taking pictures of it, Russian spy satellites. This is, a, this is what the adaptive optic system, which is what that, called, what that is called, does. That is a picture of a satellite without anything, just a big blur. That's after they use the adaptive optic system with the mirror deforming, and that is after they clean it up with a Photoshop program or something. So they could see these satellites going over, tell if they were theirs or ours, and actually, I was told, control them. The satellites would come over taking pictures, and then they would shoot a laser beam at them, which is how they were controlled, up into space and actually make them turn so that they weren't facing at the ground. And they'd come around the other side of the Earth, and the Russians would go, what happened? The satellites completely... So they'd fix it and go around a few more times, and it would come around. And they never found this out. And they never found out how the Americans knew this. And the reason they knew this is because they had people in Russia sending back this information. So if it got out that Paul Benowitz was looking in this area and sort of trying to figure out what was going on, this had nothing to do with what he was seeing, but it was right directly in his line of sight at Mon in the Manzano Hills. Um, the heads would roll, maybe literally. Um, people would be, you know, all their people in Russia would be compromised and this program would be for nothing. Later they found out uh, they could actually shine a laser up into space 
and use that instead of a star. So they could point it anywhere. So what they did was they, they would have the laser going over like that, and they would correct for whatever was going on with the, with the light source. And they, they could just you know, put it right next to a satellite and follow it through the sky. And they were able to do this during the day as well. Here's a very weird picture that uh, may have something to do with that. Bill Moore was at uh, Paul's place one time, and Paul said, take your camera, point it out toward the Manzano Mountain, and just take pictures. Make sure it's at a thousandth of a second. I get some strange stuff. Bill said, okay, what the hell. A few months later, he got the pictures back, and he got this thing. He could not see it when he was, when he was doing the, uh, taking the picture. And it looks like it might be a laser flying through the air very quickly. I do not know, but the weird thing about it is the light goes up here and stops. I do not know why it does that, and that was not put in the book because they said it would not reproduce well. So there are a lot of things going on here at Kirtland that they did not want Paul to know about. Um, After about 10 years of this, um, Paul got progressively more and more paranoid. He said that aliens were coming through the walls of his house every night, drugging him and making him drive his car out into the desert. And the weird, strange, disturbing, and horrible fact was he did actually have injection marks on his arms. And other people saw them. Gabe saw them. Dodie saw them. Bill Moore saw them. I asked them all independently what arm were they on, and they all said right arm. So unless he was doing it himself and didn't realize he was doing it, somebody or something was actually injecting him with something. Um, there, is, there is a precedent for this if you look at any of the MK Ultra type uh, stuff that went on in the 60s. Um, but that is something nobody would tell me anything about, probably for good reason. Um, because by about 1986 or 87, um, he was so far gone that Bill said he went to lunch with him once and watched him smoke an entire pack of cigarettes without touching any of his food. Bill said, you know, you better ramp it down here, at, uh, Paul. And Paul said, no, I'm okay, I can handle it. Um, but his family did not think so, so they actually took him to a mental health facility and put him in there f- for his own good um, for about a month. I thought he was in there for years, and it turns out he was in there for a month. When he came out, he was a lot less excitable, although he still was interested in the UFO subject, but he did not cause the problems for himself, his family, and other people that he did um, before. And it certainly shortened his life and made him sick for uh, many years afterwards. Uh, Two weeks, I believe, before I went to Albuquerque to first start working on this story, Paul Benowitz died. That's the uh, obituary that was in the um, Albuquerque Journal. I was going to read something here, but I don't have enough time. I did want to make the point that I didn't look into this story expecting to say that the U.S. government invented the UFO subject, that all UFOs are just something the government tries to make us think is something from outer space, or that... You know, the UFO, you know, ufology is, is constantly being monitored and controlled by the government. I do not think that's true. I think they're very interested in it, and I think there are some very weird things that went on while Paul was experiencing all this, things that are still remain unexplained. Something I mentioned in the book were these strange orange balls of light that floated around in his house. Bill Moore saw them. Gabe saw them. Um, I, but nobody would tell me, tell me what those were. Doty said he did not know what they were. I think he probably does, but I have no way of finding out. And those, those lights that he saw at first, I, I do not know what those were, but they, they seem to hang around military bases quite a bit, as all of you know. And uh, the technology is always 20 or 30 years ahead of where we think it is. And uh, finally, um, I did not uh, moralize in the book or have some sense of... Um, Indignate, moral indignation about things goes simply trying to tell a story and get to the bottom of what happened. I thought that was somebody saying shh at me. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, and Doty has expressed some sort of remorse from, for what happened to Paul and tried to make up with him. His family never wanted him to have any contact with Doty anymore for understandable reasons. And um, Doty actually said he thinks I didn't take the Air Force enough to task in the book for what they did to poor Paul Benowitz. And probably I didn't, but um, we're all grown-ups here, and by looking at the evidence, we can, we can make up our own minds that what was done was to a U.S. citizen was wrong, 
and they went about it completely the wrong way, even if they thought it was for the right reasons. And um, by knowing what is false, we can concentrate on possibly what is not and get some kind of answers in this, uh, in this weird field we decided to be interested in. So that's all I have. If there's any questions, we've got a few minutes. I can't see anyone. Oh, there we go. You know, I just think it's really shameful of what they did. They should have just been honest with him and told him up front what was going on. That's one of the reasons why um, a lot of us that are interested in UFOs and stuff don't trust our government because they're not honest. There are a lot of things that are going on and they should have been honest about, uh, about what they did. Right. Um, but you know what? The people tell me that and they say, why do you listen to those people? They lie. It's like, yes, but they talk. And if they talk, once in a while you're going to get a piece of something in that huge pile of crap that will actually connect to what you want. And if you don't let them take you somewhere like they did with Paul, kind of keep an even keel, I think you're okay. You just have to listen. That's the thing. Uh, Unfortunately, you do have to listen. The question I had was, um, in the pictures that you showed over uh, the mountains, over Manzal and Coyote Canyon, is there a possibility that... uh, there was, like, crash debris down there. A what? And that debris down there that Paul did see when he was flying over. Yes, he did see debris. And is it, it looks to me like they might have touched up those pictures. Like, somehow the Air Force got hold of what Paul had seen and they touched have, them up. They may have, but he said he had pictures that were a lot clearer than that, and somebody took them. Then... That, to me, tells right there the Air Force or someone, NSA or someone, obviously had gotten hold of those photos that Paul had taken and doctored them up. Yeah, Gabe Valdez and and, um, Paul and a guy from the Hickory Apache tribe that owns that land went up there and looked, and they actually found broken off trees, gouges in the ground, and they actually found a a, a pen with a U.S. government written on it. So something did crash there. They just didn't want him to know or anybody else to know what that was. Thank you. Hello. Was there any involvement by any of the other local authorities, county authorities, or yeah, there was um, uh, civil uh, police authorities in uh, the institutionalization of Paul Benowitz? And also, Mm -hmm. could you also could you express your personal opinions about any uh, of the validity of information regarding a base at Dulcie? Okay, yeah, that first part's easy. Um, As far as I know, Paul's family were the ones that committed him because they were scared about his safety, about his health, and they didn't want to lose their father. Perfectly understandable. The second part of the question, is there any truth to there being a base at Dulcie? Well, for the longest time I thought no. I still pretty much think no. But uh, recently I talked to Gabe Valdez, and he said, I think there actually kind of was something there. It had nothing to do with aliens, and it wasn't as big as we thought it was. But there was, I think there was something there. But um, I've never seen any evidence besides people talking about it and saying they saw things sticking up out of the ground. One person actually told me, I know there was a base there, and I'd stake my life on it. And I said, how do you know? I said, well, I, had, I have good information. And I said, did they, did, did, uh, good source. Did that source actually go up there and check it out? Yes. What did they find? Uh, uh, air vents sticking up out of the ground. I said, did they put their hand on it? Did they listen to it to see if there's any air going in it? No. I said, well, it could have just been a pipe somebody shoved in the ground. Who knows what that could have been? Um, and he said, well, my source is good. And I said, well, I, I, I need personally better evidence than that. And he said, well, why didn't you go out and check it out? I said, because if I don't think something's there, why should I go out and check it out? You have to convince me. So I say, that's pretty compelling. And then I walk out there and see. So, no, I don't think, there's, I don't think there was any base there, regardless of people coming out and saying that they worked at it. Because there's no way of checking those people out. I mean, they, they, none of those people have had any, any evidence besides their own opinion about and their own accounts about there being anything there. So that may convince some people. It doesn't convince me. Like I said, I don't think there's anything there. But as with everything in this book, just about everything, it's an open question still. I, I'll wait for evidence. If something convinces me, I'll, I'll sure as hell go up there. Might not be there anymore, though. 
Whatever happened to the uh, information that Dr. Benowitz uh, came up with regarding weapons and monitoring, UFO monitoring, all of that technology? What happened to that? Uh, these were things he developed on his own, and uh, he said he could detect when UFOs were over the house. That's another thing. Paul, Bill said he was in Paul's house and said, and this was another weird thing which Bill told me about later. He was in Paul, Paul's house, and um, he said, they're here right now. Bill said, who? The aliens, they're here. They're over the house. How do you know? Look at my instrument. He said he had sort of a seismograph, and it was going nuts. And he said, they're scanning you right now. Really? And he says, yes. If they... If they if, if they scan you again, you'll know it. And Bill said he suddenly felt this, like, bad hot flash. It's a very strange thing. And Paul said, did you feel that? Bill said, yeah, what was that? And he said, they were scanning you. They know why you're here, and they know what you're doing here. And they do that. That's, that's the way they do it. So what and happened he, to that? Infamous? All that stuff, he, after, after he went to that, after he was institutionalized and came back, I think he, he still did it, but he figured nobody was listening to him, so he didn't really make much of a deal out of it anymore. It seems like a lot of what he experienced might have been military, trying to keep him away from their research. Uh huh. Um, in your research, have you figured out a point when, where our technology got so good, black budget technology, where nowadays you can't tell you can't tell the difference if you see something, you can't tell if it's maybe non-human or maybe it's secret government. Is there a point where our, our technology reached that point where now you, you know any years where you can't tell the difference anymore? I think you can't tell the difference anymore. It's like that Arthur C. Clarke quote that any sufficiently advanced technology is like magic to us. So, yeah, I, I'm fairly well convinced that there are things that are being made, done, have been developed that we just say is UFOs now. Not to say everything you see in the sky is a secret government project. That certainly does not cover the entire range of experience, abductions, um, landings, everything that we've known for years and years. There's no way that's going to cover it, but it does cover a lot of it, I think. Was there, you remember, was there a certain year, like in the 50s, 60s, where we actually, you know, where the evidence the might show? The bar keeps being moved every time, you know? Right. If we, saw, if we saw a stealth fighter, well, you know, a stealth fighter flies, but, um, but the thing is, when people first saw a stealth fighter, they couldn't believe it actually flew. So, you know, it's that kind of thing. The bar, you know, our expectations keep moving, and those things keep moving 20 or 30 years ahead of where... 30 years ahead of where we expect them to be.